He goes from zero to flat out in just a handful of minutes. We've had near 90 days of relative peace, and now all of a sudden the workload up and down the CBD requires about medium brake stress around here. Tire wear is relatively low. The track's reasonably dirty on day one, but we had very good speed in the first practice session, quicker than the corresponding session last year by about three tenths of a second, but Wink Cup in that brand new Holden Commodore for Red Bull Holden Racing Team getting the job done, two tenths of a second over. An enthused Mark Winterbottom who's got some pace on his side at the moment. The spread was near three seconds. James Golding was the slowest in the field. The best of the rookies was um, actually a great performance uh, by Richie open. Stanaway in 16th position. Cars are out now for their second 40 minute hit out, our final of the two practice sessions to be held today and then we go qualifying this afternoon and that'll sort out the roll into the top 10 shootout for tomorrow so it doesn't resolve the grid. Quite a lot of stories going up and down pit lane. Probably the most bizarre thing that I spotted was Andre Heimgartner with a hacksaw and some foam that wasn't a precision instrument. And he's got, uh, he needs some more lumbar support and his seat and he's getting dead legs. So that was hurting his cause, but he still ended up doing quite a decent time. And Mark Scope comes back into the commentary box. I heard you cover off what I spoke to Wes McDougall about as well, but for Todd Hazelwood, we're talking the rookies here. He had a slow puncture, didn't get on it on a, a decent tire. But that's another little sub story within as we welcome you back into the commentary box and very interested to see what can be produced here because this will be a little bit of a preview of what's to come for qualifying this afternoon. It certainly will be, Neil. And I was also really impressed. You just spoke about Andre Heimgartner and there's nothing worse around here than having your leg or your foot go numb. But his speed was fantastic given he didn't put a new tyre on. And the challenge for the Nissan guys, and I like it when it happens, is who's going to be the lead Nissan when Michael Caruso and Rick Kelly, two very experienced operators, they battled last year, 12th and 13th in the championship. But for Andre, it's a very good target when you've got two well-credentialed, very good operators in that garage. Now, also, the funny thing was, I went and had a really good look at Scott McLaughlin's car. Now, they, in typical DJR Tim Penske land, they went to a lot of detail to make sure that left rear was still right. So they, were, they had the jig on the car, they looked at the left-hand rear, they made sure it was back on the scales. And it looks like overall that the guys are using less camber with the construction tyre that we're using this year. Overall, less camber. Almost to the man, it's way back on camber. We are on board now with Scott McLaughlin. Little mistake for him in the braking area and the approach to turn four at the end of Wakefield Street. Car didn't ride the bumps nicely there. Scuffed the left-hand corner of that car. Mark's just covered off their attention to detail in managing whether there's any, any geometry impact there. This is turn eight. It's interesting to see how hard many of the drivers are working. Not so much at actually attacking the racetrack and they've got enough muscle memory over the years to have done plenty of this to understand what they're dealing with. I'm really interested by the number of movements that I'm seeing of bias percentage and anti-roll bar adjustments because they are in such finite mode looking for speed at the moment that they're trimming the cars. Oh, this is a big wild arrival for McLaughlin. They rehearse this to see how hard they can run into pit lane. That is slightly over the number. It's too fast. Yeah, it's too look quick. At that. And then they look at this detail oh, later. Oh, good. Thank you. Ludo Lacroix on the radio, his engineer. So uh, there's a full-blown rehearsal arriving into the pit lane. Remember that all the fringes of the racetrack at the moment are very slippery because it's a temporary racetrack, a lot of construction in the lead-up, so it's quite messy until everything starts to clean up and rubber in. That was that left-hand rear corner we saw there. Now, one of the interesting ones, young Stuart McDonald, who's now engineering this car for Lee Holdsworth, he got bought quite badly at the end of the last session. It lost two and a half tenths. It actually would have put Lee way up. He was back in seventh, actually, in reality. So it was a good, it was a good run from him. Just while you were grabbing some of those numbers, we caught a glimpse of Todd Hazelwood just pointing in the wrong direction down at turn nine. This is the Dunlop Super 2 champion of 2017. And it's a former Dick Johnson Racing Team Penske car. 
wasn't nice over the curbs in the last session. That was Les McDougall's main focus. We talked about the puncture before. They had a rookie test, and it was the first opportunity to understand, knowing that this guy and team and group have been working with the whole Commodore. Now they've got the Ford Falcon. It requires many different things to get the most out of it. So they felt that that was a useful day at Queensland Raceway. They didn't get a lot of calories out of Sydney Motorsport Park, they felt. But because of the three very different types of racetracks, they're pioneers each time as we pick the replay up down at turn nine, big lock of the rear brakes, and you can see how busy Todd is trying to grab that. What has been great, Wes said, he's a long way back, isn't he? He sits, he's got his arms well outstretched. You just made the gesture in the com box. Uh, what has been really helpful for them is that Dick Johnson Race and Team Penske have been tremendous in their assistance with setup sheets and data, and they're hoping to share more of that as the season progresses. Lee made a little mistake in his practice session, didn't get the most out of it, and bumped into one of his senior crew members, George Smith, down there, who's an old friend of ours over many years, Preston Hire Racing. This is not a brand new chassis, clearly cloaked in brand new bodywork. Did a big job over the summer season to get this car out there. And in the first session for car number 18, it was position number 12 for Lee Holdsworth, nine tenths of a second away. Now they're running, as you said, in terms of specification, it's a 888 built car, but there's a few tweaks. Jeff Gregg and the rest of the team have got some other engineering ideas, and there's a few little tweaks that they've made to the front geometry of this car. So they're testing that at the moment. Jeff just said to me a second ago that they've actually gone back to the shock absorber that they were using at the end of last year, which just to tame the car a little bit, the car was a little bit nervous. So Holdsworth is always very good around street circuits, isn't he? He's a, he's a performer on those sorts of places. I'll think back a few years ago, Townsville, uh, Sydney, Olympic Park, he was tremendous as well. Mark Winterbottom is at the top, but the fella that we're focused on here, Lee Holdsworth, has just gone into P2. So it's a 21-0 for Mark Winterbottom, who's actually come back into the lane, the Botolo Ford Falcon. Lee Holdsworth next, but he's got a curb hop for his trouble. That was also a big issue for Jack LeBrock. I spoke to Adrian Burgess, team manager, team principal down there at Techno Autosports, and they've got to get a bit on top of that one because come qualifying, he can't be that hungry at turn two. Back to Fabian Coulthard here. Good luck, mate, just turn 11. And he's up in sixth Stop position. It. Up five spots on that lap. Winterbottom, Holdsworth, Slave, Waters, Pie, Coulthard, Percat. Pretty happy with his car in that last session. He's up now in seventh position in car number eight for Blackwoods. Did you hear that little comment there from Mark Fenning about a hey, good lap, but just needed to be a little bit better at turn 11? That's often the most difficult corner on the whole layout. As we look at Dick Johnson and Roger Penske, great to have Roger with us for the weekend. Who just literally arrived from North America, so he's just arrived together with his wife Kathy and Jonathan Gibson, vice president of the race team, have just literally stepped into Adelaide <laughs> off their, their private flight, so that's a big mission. So we go back to turn eight. Boys, uh, Rick Kelly at the moment is out there with uh, no dash working at the moment on his car. They, uh, he was late to leave the lane. They had to push it back in actually after after he started that car. Maybe you can see it on there. He's got some shift lights, but he's got nothing else on that dash at the moment. So the shift lights are working, which is the main thing, I suppose. But uh, they've got a uh, configuration issue with the Motec dash at the moment in car 15. It's not holding him back at the moment from what you can see, but he's continuing on while they try to fix that in the lane. And he'll come in and, I suppose, plug back in and get a reconfig to the dash. Those things are niggly too, aren't they? When you have that sort of stuff, you know, Greg, and Mark knows only too well. When something alters with the ergonomics of the car or something changes in the visual reference in the car, it's distracting, and sometimes it's not even that the data is necessarily that important, although increasingly everybody's looking at block lights and, and uh, or having the audio in their ears or whatever system they use, managing wheel spin, etc. But the, whenever something like that unfolds, it just, you know what, makes you frustrated. Shane Van Gisbergen on screen here, reigning champion for the Adelaide 500. Car number 97, perfect score for him last year. We saw a couple of mistakes at the back end of that hot run in practice one. That was wild off seven, wasn't it? He had it all jumping and it was a full motocross act over the top of the curb there. He ended up in fourth position. He was only half a second away. Whoa, he turned at the corner there. Yeah, that was why I, I made mention of it immediately because he turned at the corner before he got out of the throttle. He just cursed himself there. He completely overshot. Oh, uh, turn nine, sorry. 
He's gone to the top with a 20.38. That previous lap is P1 by second. It's worth actually seeing all that again because his run into eight was wild. It, both, it stopped both of us in our tracks as we thought he'd half a chance to eat some concrete. And then when he got out the other side, he outbraked himself down at nine. But then he actually, as he was trying to feed at first gear, he clenched his fist. Check it out. So that's the level of intensity. That's the level of frustration when you don't quite stitch it together the way you want. The point is, it's an incredibly fine line between getting that just right, braking to the last millimetre at maximum pressure without locking those brakes, get it slightly wrong, and then it just destroys the lap and he's aborted. And it was wild prior to that as well. Well, that's actually what happens. It gets you out of the rhythm. Because when you have a monster moment like that coming out of turn eight, more often than not, you have a situation of uh, missing the braking marker or making a little mistake at turn nine. So this is Hazelwood in the pit. This is the, the new... Teal, which is the word that Michael Crusoe is using for the new colour, the, that bluey sort of turquoisey colour he's calling teal. Is that all right? It's fine by me. Okay. Well, that's we his, that's a couple of wild stabs over the years at colours, but that'll do. <laughs> okay. Well, he's calling it teal, and he thinks he's, he thinks it suits him. <laughs> thinks with his new haircut and his new look that the teal is the right colour. I went to drive him in the, after the first session, and he was heavily ensconced in debrief land, so I left him in peace. But now I'm all armed up with teal. I feel better about life. So Shane Van Gisberg and Mark Winterbottom, Lee Holdsworth, one, two, and three. They've been cool tired up into fourth position. Michael just moved up 15 spots on that lap that we followed him. He's now just outside the top 10. Wincup's got a curb hop in 15th. What's up? Did that just take you straight back to Leighton House, Ivan Capelli, the Formula One days here? Very did close. You, did you? Yeah, you straight back there. Adrian knew that was a pretty cool car. That was a good car. Did you? Did you like the colour? Comparison? It's, oh. Where did that come from? Who gave you that? Who fed you that? <laughs> oh <dear. laughs> so Van Gisberger with a 20.38, slightly slower than his teammate Jamie Winkup from P1 with a 20.16. They'll be faster at the end of this session. They'll, they'll throw more tyres out as a qualifying simulation. It's pretty animated. I noticed when I went through the garage earlier that they had rear dampers out of uh, Jamie's car. Didn't really get to have a chance to talk to Grant there, who's got one of his headset just peeled back for that conversation about what changes they made, what Shane was looking for. But that's not a bad number, 23, 20.3, I should say. And it was a 20.16 for his teammate in the last session. Not much in it. Tim Blanchard, car number 21. Cool drive entry on screen. New bodywork, ZB bodywork on this car, cool drive racing. However, this is a, an older chassis, but they completely stripped and rebuilt this across summer. Preparation for the brand new year. Like they didn't have enough going on at Brad Jones yeah. Racing. So they've uh, turned out three of these brand new cars. Todd sitting, uh, correction, Tim, I beg your pardon, sitting in 23rd at the moment. Have a look at the ride height. Have a close look at the ride height there. I think a lot of the customer ZBs are running very high at the front. I heard you say that before. It makes a lot of sense. At the moment, they're not flush with spares because it's been such a crush to get everything done in a short period of time. So running that too low damages the skirt and the under tray on the front splitters on these cars. It might be something that we can have a look at down in the pit lane at some stage. And uh, quite an expensive bit of kit. Very critical to the car performance. Uh, but what you don't want is to be in a position where you're in short supply. And as you said, when they're in short supply like that, they're so easily worn out on a street circuit like this, as bumpy as it is. So they produce about 130 or 140 kilos of downforce at 200 kilometres an hour. So they're quite a useful device when you're going quick. And as we pick up on Mark Winterbottom I'm finishing that lap just slightly slower than the previous one. So 2108 plays at 2113. Replay of James Courtney, former Adelaide 500 winner. And that is beyond maximum attack. That's a bruise on the left rear corner of that car. He came out of the throttle, but it was too late. Van Gisbergen almost did that when we rode with him. So that'll actually be a scar that they'll need to look more carefully at down at uh, 
over one boost racing. So Shane Van Gisbergen about to get back in. He's fastest so far. Uh, we were inside the Tickford garage a moment ago, and I was going to make the comment about Chas Mostert as we pick up Tim Slade, who's sixth at the moment. I said to Mozzie, how was your session? He goes, we got lost. And uh, so we changed a whole bunch of things. Some things that we thought were changing weren't. And then in the end, we just, he said, we just lost the plot. We got lost. We got lost. So I went, OK. Not very technical, but very honest. <laughs> we got lost. That's funny. <laughs> Anton T. Pasquale is 15th at the moment, so he's the fastest of the rookies in this session so far. That's a pretty impressive time, a 21.78. This currently P2, currently P2. Uh, he's back with a 20.78. Uh, Anton T. Pasquale is one staircase and on the back street, back half a lap, we're pretty good. <laughs> Alistair's given him two thirds of the circuit. Yeah, <laughs> he's only a little bit quicker than the loose spot. <laughs> so he's referencing his performance to Shane Van Gisberg and the team see the timing information in micro detail, they call it micro sectors, so they can see exactly where their competitors are or stronger or not. That's Richie Stanaway, wild exit for him out of turn six and then it slid all the way into seven. You can actually hear the tyre chatter in the background there. 24 minutes remaining in this session. Roughly one third to one half of the field are in the lane at the moment. A great start opening account there for Will Davison in that first session, Mark Milwaukee Racing. Great performance to end up being fifth fastest for Will, who at one point at the end of last year was contemplating it all being over as a full-time participant in the Virgin Australia Supercars champion, uh, Championship. So for him to get a great seat with Phil Monday, who sold his businesses, and Will's gone to P2. He's only 0.4 of a second away now in the Milwaukee entry. That's a great job. This is a Tickford racing car. It's an XCAM Waters car. Back to Lee Holdsworth. So Phil's, he's cleaned the, he's cleaned the sheet, sold his businesses, racing's his passion, and he's having a huge crack. And uh, they've done a beautiful job down there. The car's been very well presented. There's a lot of passion and enthusiasm. There's some very skilled people in that outfit. And it's great to see Will getting a decent result out of it. Yes, he's obviously a very, very good driver, isn't he? And we've seen over the years him put on some very good performances and that's another example of his skill and he, he actually said before about the technique of driving the car based on what he's been driving to get his brain around this specification car again is actually quite difficult he also made an excellent speech at aaron noonan's wedding and gave aaron noonan the dessert clip over the year as well as he should so uh, will did a nice job of that so there's a human side to these guys. They, some of them got a little bit of a break over summer, but for most of the teams, most of the drivers, pretty hard work. P3 for Scott McLaughlin on the lap where we've just picked him up. So that's a very good time, but he's actually curb hopped. So Van Gisbergen has curb hopped. So is McLaughlin. Holdsworth, LeBrock and Golding. So there's an epidemic out there at the moment all of a sudden as everybody tries to pick up the tempo. Back to Chaz Mostert. And I don't need to refer to my notes for his comments after the first session. That was the, we got lost. <laughs> Not in terms of finding his way around the track, but they just ended up in all the wrong directions set up wise and it wasn't to his liking. It's interesting he's using second gear at the final corner. I think One or two of them still use first there, but problem with first gear is unless you've got great tyre condition, you just buzz the rear tyres up so much. There's the turn two hot spot that if you get it wrong, you get clobbered with a curb hop. Goodbye right mirror. Will Davison on the exit of turn 11. Here's the other angle of that. Actually, he was, that was big dose of steer. So yeah. he almost grabbed that tyre barrier, let alone the concrete wall. And then the action continued, so heart rate's up for Will in the cockpit there at the moment. He's in maximum attack mode, currently in position number two. <laughs> Flies it over the bumps at turn two. I don't think he could drag another tenth of a second out of that thing at the moment. He's using every little bit of road. He'll need more than WD-40 to fix the back of that mirror. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, now, it mightn't be an exact science sometimes, this whole aero thing, but... When I said before about them running the front of this car high, it's actually not a little bit, it's a long way high. In racing terms, two or three millimetres makes big differences. And look at the ride height at the front there, based on James's comments and the amount of understeer they've got. Look at the air gap under the front there, even under full braking load coming into turn 14. You watch the car coming down into 
turn one and then at the end of Wakefield Street into turn four. See the air gap there? It's exaggerated by the amount of what we call speedboat effect. So when you have the rear geometry and the front geometry set like they've got them in a straight line with the weight transfer, the car goes backwards, makes the front come up. And then obviously when you put your foot on the brake, it transfer the load to the front, then the right height comes back down again at the front. But it's a little bit of an issue in terms of wanting to run the car lower, make the car more accurate. The lower you run the front of the car through all those 90 degree corners, the more rake and the more response that you get from the first turn of the steering wheel, which makes a big difference. New race number for this season for James Courtney as well, number 25, and that's in celebration of 25 years in partnership with Mobile. So we're accustomed to seeing James 22 on the car. So the official name is Mobile One Boost Mobile Racing. Can you do that again? No, it takes a little bit of concentrating that one. Exit turn 11. This is one of the hardest spots on the racetrack right here. You've got to park the car up on top of the curb at 13, land it, keep it mobile and not scrub any pace off it, but land it squarely and not lock it inside front into the final corner. Much easier said than done. Yeah, and often it looks like you unsettle the car through there, but you don't really by climbing the curb. Once you can get the car off the curb and settle it down, what you said before is exactly right. You've got to try to modulate the brake and easy to lock the inside front especially as wind cup comes up 10 spots up to ninth might be actually have doing a few laps we'll just get a little read here to Race who's run. doing some some runs here at the moment yeah because there are two parts of the story as always michael andretti oh big trouble for cam waters damaged the brand new car it's yanked the right front out of that car and you can see the scuff marks down the left side that'll be turn eight what a frustration for waters whose pre-season prep has been intense and he's very cranky with himself. Red flag, Brad Wusherson, Nathaniel Osborne in the garage okay? at Tickford. That's a very, very disappointing sight for those folks in that garage. And for Cam Waters, very heavy contact that's now triggered the red flag with 18 minutes and 45 seconds remaining. Good news is he's okay, the car is not. And uh, you can see what his body language is like. It's 28, nearly 29 degrees out there at the moment. The other thing that's noticeable is the sunlight. So the grip will be a little different to the way in which it was this morning. And as he peels that guard back to have a look, the news is all bad there for Cam Waters. Opportunity for us as we like to do at this point also mark to say thanks to the volunteer officials that come from far and wide Members of camps affiliated car clubs to affect this event. So he's in good hands down there and they'll retrieve this car and uh, We'll get back on with this session, but that's a disappointment. Let's see what happened turn eight There's been signs of this from a few people so it's big push understeer is not responding to the front and is just bruised that wall hard and then it's just it's just a disaster for the next couple of hundred meters here's the onboard i wonder where it plucks the right oh here we go about to tell yeah. the story yeah i was yeah. about to say there's more to it so when he gets to the next wall so so it's bad enough that they're dealing with uh, left hand damage on this car but they've now got it going on both sides so here's the other angle that's very heavy contact that's going to get into cross members and uprights and you name it especially this one now and now this one here yeah bang that's hit hard yeah so that's both Look. sides of the front and the left rear so the only thing that you might have got away with there is there might be minimal bruising on the right rear but do you remember Mostert doing a similar thing? Remember it went right across to the inside wall? It's unusual when you've done that and you've plugged that out. Well, you can't steer. It's, it's, um, yeah, you, yeah, you're a passenger, you're aren't you? just basically sitting there going for the ride. But he turned, when he turned in, there were two things. We'll have a look at the turn-in spot. But when he turned in, it's still going really quick when he made contact with that right-hand wall. Wow. That's a brand-new well, car, remember? The tethers have held... The, the tethers have done their job and they've held that right front wheel. Um, and the way the braking system works, you can only, you can lose two of your brakes, but you can't lose them all. So that can also be part of the story where you're trying to stop the thing when you look at what's going on with the right front. So very sad set of circumstances and we'll 
get Greg but to he, jump into the conversation he, as well. He turned in shallow. So when we look at the turn-in point, that'll be the the interesting part will be in the difference to the normal line. It was quite a shallow turn-in point. And then when you don't break the car a lot, it looked like it had understeer from the turn-in point. So that was the thing that caught him out and ran wide. Murph? Did it look a did it look a bit strange, though, boys, when he did try to actually turn and how it uh, didn't quite, you know, turn as well as we expected it to? Now, that car was on the patch uh, just before practice two came off the patch after some damage to it on the left front uh, prior to that session. So they pulled, pushed that car out um, just as the session started because they'd been doing work on it, replacing the front bar and also, I think, a little bit of suspension stuff after hitting the tyres down at turn one during practice one. And I was just sort of looking at that replay, and it, it, it just didn't seem to react right. I don't know if it was just understeer, was it? I, I think I think it's actually... What's actually happened, you know what it's like there, Greg? What you're trying to do is not retard the car very much, aren't you? You're trying to really apply the brake and very smooth. gently and yeah, be smooth. Yeah, yeah. So I think what he did is he turned it in a little bit too narrow, and he didn't brake it as hard or a little bit later than normal, and that then just didn't bite. It didn't make the apex, and then he was in plenty of trouble after that. I think that's what's unfolded. And I think he's uh, obviously brand spanking new car doing that kind of damage, but uh, they didn't get the most out of it in practice one either. So um, we'll keep an eye on it when it comes back, but that's uh, we won't be seeing that car for the rest of the day, will we? I, I would, yeah, I agree. I think the damage on the right-hand side, that was a, quite an acute angle in the end that made contact with the fence on the right. Yeah, big time, and with substantial speed. So if you look at the data, which they will, um, that's a big impact, big G-force loading. They ended up being sixth fastest in that first session. And the reason why Cam's so animated about it is that he just knows the implications of that for the start of his championship. So all that work that's gone on in the off-season and a brand new car all came undone in a couple of milliseconds with it in the wall on the left-hand side at turn eight and then ricocheting back to the right on the run down to turn nine. Couldn't steer it at that point. So Blackwood's fly cam shows us the run down pit straight here. You've made the point several times over the weekend, Mark, about how wonderful it is as a driver. There's Frank Adamson from Supercars, Chris O'Toole, Tickford Racing. They're working and talking on the topic of recovery of the car and where they'll bring it back and what they'll do. It's one of the few theatres of motorsport here in Adelaide where you, you get a true sense of the atmosphere in the cockpit of the car, where you can actually hear the cheering and uh, the sea of flags and just, just the animation of the crowd as you come out of the final corner is a wonderful thing. Jamie Wincup's experienced that. He's had 10 victories at this location and so far off to a good start the weekend with the fastest practice time in the first practice, 1 minute 20.1. And looking for him on the board at the moment, he's in ninth position. His teammate Shane Van Gisbergen is the fastest camps race control. And uh, thank you again to the men and women that are working hard in there. You can see that they've got not only our pictures, but they've also got their own ISO cameras as well, so they can see various parts around the racetrack. This is Mostert, Chaz Mostert in conversation with Adam Debora, his engineer. Well, we've got this opportunity for a break on track. Betty Clemenko will take, um, take a look at the Peter Brock trophy that you're taking on tour this year. Yeah, well, you know, if you think about Peter Brock, he was the the uh, driver of the people and I think that all the people deserve to see exactly what this trophy looks like and have a chance to have a photo next to it and to have a look at it and uh, even though I have a little bit of suspicion that's why we cover it during a race but uh, no it's a good thing the people are loving it there the fans are coming down having a look to see exactly what it is that we all go bananas for once a, once a year. It was a pretty special moment for yourself, the team, Dave and Luke, and now you were able to share that moment with everybody here throughout oh, exactly. the year of 2018. Exactly, and that's that's what it is. It's about sharing that moment. And unless you see that trophy, you don't you don't get the the whole gist of the of the what the race means to someone. Yeah, pretty cool for you to do with uh, the fans of Supercars. Thanks, Betty. Oh yeah, and it's it's all tied up. It's <laughs> it's not going no one, anywhere. No one, no, not going anywhere. God help me. Thanks, Betty. Well, it's a wonderful sight. That's what everybody in the business works so hard for. And tremendous for everybody at Erebus, for Betty, for David, for Luke. Luke gilden has been re-signed for that team as an enduro driver. There's already been Good some news. very exciting announcements in that regard. The majority of the field's been set already. And uh, we haven't cleared... Well, we we've barely cleared the summer season and we're all talking about what might happen in September, October. So that's pretty amazing. Russell Ingall was trying to get a gig with Rick Kelly last night. <laughs> 
I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't it? It should just read Russell Ingalls trying to get a gig, <laughs> dot, 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 because that's a never-ending process. Um, Rusty French, co-owner at Tickford Racing, so he's one of the people that um, has been a passionate believer in Ford and in this race team. He's been a heavy investor in it, together with Rod Nash, Sven Burkhart. And they've invested a lot of time, money and effort, and personal blood, sweat and tears in that operation and given Ford fans lots to cheer about. If I said to you before the start of this weekend, in practice two, would Will Davison be the fastest Falcon? What would you have said to me? No. Good job, huh? Very good job. And that's why I made the point before about what reward it is for Phil Monday for his investment. Uh, Tim Edwards, these are great conversations to have. <laughs> uh, that one's not new anymore. No, it's a shame when you do that to a brand new car. But anyway, it'll be as good as new by tomorrow, hopefully. Yeah, that's, uh, this, the, the primary hit didn't actually look too bad, but obviously broke, I would say, a steering arm or something that sent it across the road. And that second hit was not very nice. Yeah, I think yeah, the, the first hit probably, as you say, plucked the steering arm off the upright or something like that. It, um, you can see there's a camber change there. but And then obviously, yeah, they bounced across the road and ricocheted down all the way to the end. So, yeah, there's a fair amount of damage. And I suspect even the rear, you know, that when you hit the uh, the rear as square on as you did with that, it's, there's a fair chance that it's actually probably bent those mounts in the rear as well. Yeah. Um, going away from that, pretty positive, though. Uh, next door there, Frosty's uh, obviously got a bit of a, uh, you know, good step going on there at the moment. He's pretty happy with the way things are going. Yeah, look, they all seem reasonably happy with the handling of the car. I mean, it's never perfect. You know, we're all, we're all trying to fine-tune them. And I think, you know, once we put some better tyres on at the end of the session, we'll kind of get a better read where we're at. Thanks, mate. No worries. Edwards. This is a poignant message, unfortunately, for the supercars community. Steve Brabeck, who was a huge investor and believer in our sport, lost his life in January. And so racing for Steve is the message on the Dick Johnson Racing Team Penske cars. And a very sad moment when that advice came through that uh, we'd lost Steve, a popular and familiar figure in the pit lane, a huge supporter of Dick, Jill, Stephen Johnson, and then in partnership with that team, a uh, you know, team that literally dug itself out in the recent past all the way to the very top of the game again in the recent past and uh, really saddened by his loss. So our thoughts in the entire supercar community are with Steve's family. Go on board now with Mark Winterbottom, who was very fast in the first session. And I was a little surprised when I heard that all four cars were so different from Tickford Racing when they first rolled them out because often it's hard to get a read from tyre to tyre, car to car, driver comment, feedback, engineering philosophy sometimes difficult to equate. But Mark was the recipient of really positive feedback. He, he liked the feel of the car. It flowed nicely, didn't try to bite him. And as you said, for whatever reason, there's a little vagary there because he's Normally, style, a little bit like Lowndes, is very reliant on the front of the car. Normally, with a style like his, it would be very successful around this layout. It's always been fast, but just never really popped out with the result. As he comes up in behind his teammate. There's just under 17 minutes remaining. And a little bit of frustration just building into the back there with, I think, Scott High in behind as they all look for... A little gap. So, line of stern. Yeah, that's James Courtney. So, Kelly and then Courtney. Got to get on with it. And there's Mostert. Let's slow everybody up. Mark Winterbottom. Parked in behind that group. And then I think it was Dave Reynolds, actually, as the last car of that little squadron. Let's have a look at the sector splits. And Van Gisbergen's been the fastest in the first sector with a 27.9. Scotty McLaughlin fastest in sector two with a 19.8, and Van Gisbergen quickest man in the final sector with a 32.5. David Reynolds, car number nine. Penwright, heard from his team owner just a few moments ago. What a superb season they had last year. Bathurst win, offered the fastest Commodore in the field. We rave about the 3.8 that Scott McLaughlin did to be pole position, the fastest lap ever, but the only reason he had to do that time was because Dave Reynolds had just done a 
So it was a great performance. Fastest Commodore on the front row of the grid for Bathurst wins the race. And that's a life-changing moment for he and Luke Gilden, as you just said before. Great news for Luke. Oh. There's a drummer there with Tim Blanchard in the right rear of the cool drive Commodore. Uh, is that damage or have we got the a wheel off, I think. The wheel off, yeah. So was that encouraged or was that a mistake leaving pit lane? Which one will get in first? Oh, I'm gonna go with the <laughs> Could be a dead heat. That's awkward, isn't it? It's actually delivering itself to Dunlop. So yeah, Dunlop garage, garage is there. about 20 metres away. So if they'd, if they'd let it go, it would have rolled in there. They could have plucked it off and changed it. Please unfit me. Yeah, please unfit me. <laughs> so what's going on there? This is the cool drive entry, Tim Blanchard. This is a Brad Jones racing entry in the be very concerned as to what's going on there and why yeah in this business any time that a wheel comes off the car it doesn't get any worse gentleman in the on the far right against the wall is uh, Pete West the team manager he's a cool head who's been in the Formula One pit lane for a long period of time so they'll be studying their notes and understanding what's going on there to figure out why Andre Heimgartner is on screen at the moment. He's just come up nine spots into position five. Car number seven has taken that seat from Todd Kelly, who stepped back for 2018, and he's now in a team management role. And he had uh, a real problem with a dead leg, his right leg breaking in that last session. It's an ergonomic issue, so they were making another little seat insert for him when I went down into the garage just to make him a bit more comfortable in this session. But that's a very good start for him with this new team and he was really happy he said I just I need to know more and understand more about the car obviously the ergonomics are not quite right the driver comfort's not quite right he said it's a very different car to drive than any of the other cars that he's driven but he was pretty happy with the balance car number eight Nick Perkhat on screen there in the Blackwoods entry and he's currently sitting in 10th position as we go back to Richie Stanaway we'll be keeping an eye on some of these new names that are in the field there are five of them this year there are names that you'll be familiar with for varying reasons but they've not been a regular full-time part of the championship so 56 the number that jason bright used in the recent past at tickford is now being held by richie stanaway he's got a full-time ride he was very strong in the pertec enduro cup last year winner of the sandown 500 and he's now earned himself a full-time ride so he's sitting down the order slightly at the moment in 23rd He's been downplaying expectations, and there's a good reason for that. There's a very different tempo and requirement for sprint racing, and all of the, well, it's now 31 races in 2018, versus the way in which you go racing during the enduro season, where you're sharing the car with two drivers. The tempo of the events is a little bit different. The demand in these events, and today's a classic example, two 40-minute practice sessions. You've got to go and put your best game forward right away with very little time to think. And then you've got to go and qualify not long after that. The same applies. You have very little time to react. You've got to make very good knife-edge decisions. You can't afford to make one slight false move with adjustments or back you go in the field. All of that combines to be quite complex, and you're basically the lone ranger. Well, you're in your own car. You've got your own engineering group. Yes, there's some data share. You've got to make your own calls mid-session. That's a lot different to the way in which things typically work in endurance racing. So uh, that'll be one of the reasons why he's just a bit keen to settle everybody down that he's not going to lap the field. Oh, and he's a pretty savvy racer. I mean, you don't win races in the category under Formula One if you can't drive cars. So he's very accomplished. He's been around a long time. Factory driver for Aston Martin in sports car racing. He's got a great list of accomplishments and when you're pretty savvy and you're a hardcore racer you come in you want to play it down that's what he's done he's done a really good job of that now Chas Mostert clearly is not lost in this session because he's currently in second position so that's a good dig out they've got themselves organized now Adam Debore we saw him in the window before he's only 0.15 of a second slower than Shane Van Gisbergen the vast majority of the field are actually in the lane at the moment. We've got just over 10 minutes remaining, so we'll see another burst of activity pretty shortly. The great thing about the fly cam in this location is it gives you a really good bird's eye view of whether or not the cars make that apex at the final corner. It's a bit telling, isn't it? 
You can see who's got balance and who doesn't. That's right. It was a bit great shot that time of, uh, of Moss to get the car turned in. Really beautiful, accurate turn in point, Murph. Yeah, we've uh, got Cam Waters down here. He's just come back. Uh, looking all right physically, mate. We've seen all the camera angles of uh, the incident there at Turn 8. Um, get uh, the driver's point of view. Um, yes, obviously pretty gutting to find the fence at 8 in practice and give the guys so much work. But um, I didn't really do much different going in. It's just got a little bit loose on the entry and then it's just gone in the, the marbles and I've just stuck me in the fence. And the hit itself wasn't actually that hard, but it broke the steering and then I was a passenger and... Um, it was the second hit that did all the damage, so yeah, just so gutted for everyone. The car's feeling, or well, was feeling, pretty good. Um, so yeah, hopefully we can get a fix of qualifying. He had a little bit of a an issue in the first one as well. There was a bit of work. The car was on the patch after practice one, just getting sort of realigned. Yet is that from turn one earlier on? Um, yeah, no, the guys are doing some changes. So um, I was hit the tie bundle at one on in practice one, but that yeah, was a much damage. It was just a splitter, so. That's a lot of work, so I'm pretty gutted for everyone, but we'll be all right. They'll, they'll build it. We've got a good bunch of people in the car and we'll come out cracking for the time. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, man. Cheers. Yeah, it's not much you can add to that. Pretty frustrating for him. It is a lot of work, unfortunately, and that's going to go well into the night for everybody at Tickford Racing. Uh, he's still showing oh. 14th fastest in the session, but they've got a very, very big job in front. Tim Slade just in front of Chaz Mostert there. There's only a very small margin between them. The car's set at identical pit lane speeds. Here's the replay of what happened. Here's the approach. Cam Waters. Well wide of the apex, in the grey, understeer, parallel, very firm impact with the turn eight wall. Look at the steering and lack of it. Here's the onboard. And now look at the steering angle. And when you see the external shot, you'll see the front wheels are pointing all over the deck. The second impact is a big one that taken the right front out of the car. So here's the other angle. Right up against the wall big time. And right at the point where that surface changed. And then it just goes across the road. He's on and off the brake pedal trying to figure a way out of what is an impending disaster making the wall for the second time. Can't do it. Can't steer the car. I actually think it's a, the narrow turn in that probably did most of that. The initial understeer was the thing that got him, and it come from not getting enough turning done early and the trajectory of the car in the first phase of turning. We, you can see where it actually hit the wall on exit at eight. Very it early. Verifies that. So really frustrating for Cam. Big off-season preparation. He went to the UK back to see Rob Wilson, who's done some driver coaching with him over there. They've got a brand new car, and now they've got a huge amount of work in front of them. This is the Harvey Norman entry. Simona Di Silvestro has also got some damage there. Uh, that'll be turn one where the tyre bundle is. In fact, that was what Cam Waters was talking about before. He made pretty solid contact with that in the first practice session. So they've got a bit of race tape on there to tidy that up. Chris Stuckey engineering that car, number 78, this year. And... Uh, I thought her driving, we spoke about it in the early session, Mark, at Newcastle last year, was a bit of a coming of age in a supercar. This, this is a young lady who's been a Rookie of the Year in Indianapolis. She's had five visits there. She's vastly experienced, but supercar is a whole other deal, a very different race animal. So I thought her performance was, was outstanding there last year. She passed a lot of the heavyweights with ease. Yeah, and I spoke to her about the car around here. She was just, she said, I, I can't really get into a rhythm she did hit those tyres in the previous session also, which actually hurt the front air there. So then she th felt like through turn eight that it had too much understeer because the front aero device wasn't working properly. So just a little bit of a clumsy start there for Simona. And it's easy to do when you press your foot on the brake going in there. Now watch this. So it's the turn in point. Watch where the yellow line is and the proximity of the car there. So the car's already understeering and he's hit the fence so early so normally the exit's further down the McDonald's sign. Now watch when you see, this is either Van Gisbergen or look how far away, oh that's Caruso, turn on the turn in point from wider, wider point. So he's way out past the yellow line and he's able to get more turning done earlier. So that's the apex you can just see there with the Penrite signs and just the narrow. See how narrow it is? It's inside the line as he makes it in, doesn't get turned enough and then from that time on, you run wide, you're in the grey, you're in the fence. 
Easy to do. And it's caught a lot of people over a long period of time as we go back to David Reynolds now. He's currently sitting in fifth position. Exit turn seven for him. Just keep, a, keep an eye out for the way he turns in here. His personal best, pretty handsome. A 20 there you go. One in the first part of the racetrack and a very different line approach there to make your point, Mark. Not very many people out on the racetrack as you can see in the graphic on the left hand side there at the moment. So two green boxes for David Reynolds so far in the first two sectors of the track. He's in sector three now, turn 11. This is where a few people have run on the other side of the curbing here and given that wall a wipe. do for Dave Reynolds because it's his fastest first and second sectors but they're about two and a half tenths he go up a little bit he does he goes up two spots to third with a 20.7 so then Gisbergen, Mostert, Reynolds, Davison, McLaughlin, Heimgartner, Rick Kelly, Coulthard, Holsworth, Tander that's your 10 there's a fair few that haven't really had a proper run yet we're about to see some serious qualifying simulations new tyres there on Car one, Wink Cup's currently 13th, Winterbottom's 11th. Of the guys who haven't had a major try yet, Craig Lowndes will be one of those. He's down in 20th. Caruso's in 19th. James Courtney with that wall damage earlier is down in 22nd. So there is a lot of sunlight, but the track might have lost a little bit of grip based on temperature, but it could have gained a little bit of grip based on cleaning up and rubbering in. We saw a 20.1 for Wind Cup in the first session, quicker than the corresponding session last year. And when you stop and compare that to the records at this location, it's not a bad time, is it, Mark? So on the sort of numbers that we're seeing here at the moment, there's some opportunity that we might get into the 19s. If you're in the 19s here, you're talking about the sorts of numbers that Van Gisbergen achieved in qualifying last year, better than the lap record. So the qualifying records are 19.2 for Shane, did that last year. The lap record actually belongs to uh, Scotty McLaughlin. He did a 20.4. So we've got just over three minutes remaining now in practice number two. The Adelaide 500, first round of the 2018 Virgin Australia Supercars Championship. This is James Courtney. And uh, James at the moment is down in 23rd position. Make that 14th on this lap, so that's a decent improvement for him. Car doesn't ride the curb anywhere near as nicely as the Red Bull Holden Racing Team cars. That car of Van Gisberg just soaks the bumps up. Uh, Winkup must have had a little drama, or he's just about to start a lap, has cleared the traffic. Yeah, I'm just looking at where he's on our uh, tracker here at the moment, and he's bottled up a little bit. He's just trying to find an air gap so that he can stitch together a lap here. This is coming into the final corner. Rick Kelly see some fireworks with just a little more than two minutes remaining now as everybody gets set. So let's see what Wind Cup's best shot is and whether it does it on the first or second lap. I looked at some data after practice one. Most people did it on their first lap. This is the run up to turn four. This is where McLaughlin came unglued in the first session. It's bumpy right here. He gets it back to second gear. He feeds it in a bit early. It didn't ride super nice over the bumps, but trying to get a car to work perfectly there is a tough task. Turn five, where last year he tangled with Mark Winterbottom. Six, he's closing on this traffic. That'll start to be a problem. He might even end up with some aero disturbance down here at turn eight. No, right now. not good call. So is that uh, James Courtney or Scott Pye? I think it's Scott Pye on the right. Here we are, turn eight. Throttle in nice and early. Car was very stable through the high-speed run. Fastest middle sector. Got a lot of curb hopping going on out there at the moment. Traction coming out of that hairpin was very good. No sliding for Wind Cup. This is turn 11, second gear. All flat shifting, little micro switch on the gear lever to pull it through flat from one gear to the next. Whoa, too gets deep. It, gets it back to first. Ran very wide, what a shame. So that not only hurts that lap, but it hurts the start of the next one. He's only got 50 seconds remaining. So that mistake just cost one second. 
Yeah, and, and that will kill the beginning of the next one. So here it is from the other angle. You'll get a much better idea here. So he's fired in there. The right front is locked. So I was talking about before with clearing turn 13 and then getting the front of the car to land. And uh, that'll have put a mark on that tyre and run in totally wide. So then the next part of the problem is it murders your run onto the straight. So your terminal speeds are down. Corner exit speeds down, the terminal speeds down. So the next lap is cruel and we're almost at checkered flag point. Van Gisbergen is still the fastest. Tim Slade is up in third place. This is a good start for the Adelaide driver. Chas Mostert still sitting in position number two. Clock at zero. Checkered flag is out. Slade's come up into P2. Great performance. He's only 0.1 of a second away. Van Gisbergen, Tim Slade, Chas Mostert, Nick Perkat. And here is Nick, another Adelaide driver, Brad Jones Racing. We've got McLaughlin looking pretty speedy out here at the moment. He's going very quickly in the mid-sector. Perkett's gone P2. So keep an eye on car number 17, and that'll be a familiar phrase this year. So has he got traffic to contend with here? But McLaughlin looks pretty speedy. That's his teammate, Fabian Coulthard. So Van Gisbergen, Perkat, Slade, Mostert, Reynolds is in the pit lane, Winterbottom, Tanda, Davison, McLaughlin's currently ninth, but on target for a gain. Does Coulthard improve? Yes, up to seventh, McLaughlin, P1, a 20.3. Shell V Power racing to the top. He's got three one hundredths of a second over Van Gisbergen. There are still laps to be completed. Here comes Lowndes in the Autobahn entry. And Craig at the moment is down in 22nd. He moved it up to 15th on that lap. But that is a great performance by Scotty McLaughlin. So in the two sessions that we've had so far in our brand new season, first blood to Red Bull and the second one to Shell V Power Racing. And that's a continuation of exactly the way in which we finished the back end of last year. And your point about the sunlight and the temperature of the day has definitely slowed that session. They're two tenths slower than the previous session. So the cars are better, the drivers are better. There's more rubber down, but the atmospheric condition is slower. Good job, Scott McLaughlin. Very nice lap to finish that qualifying simulation. So we've seen quite a few people in replay down here clobbering the tyres, but that uh, was a nice one for McLaughlin. In fact, if anything, he might have overstepped slightly. But great finish to that session for him. Look how tight the margin is between McLaughlin and Van Gisberg and the Kiwi countrymen. And then good news for Adelaide motorsport fans with Nick Perkat, a former Adelaide 500 winner up in third. His teammate Tim Slade was up in second at one point. He finished up in fourth. Chas Mostert not lost in this session up in fifth. David Reynolds, Mark Winterbottom looking further down here. Craig Lowndes did squeak in a lap right at the end that vaulted him up into 15th. Andre Heimgartner well done right there with his teammate Michael Caruso. And then looking further down at some of these rookies and not so rookie, Jamie Winkup with that mistake down in 16th mark. And then a couple of these other fellas that we've been talking about, Jack LeBrock 21st, Anton Di Pasquale 22nd, Todd Hazelwood 23rd, Richie Stanaway 25th. So a little bit of work to do for those guys and not unexpected when you consider the task of this racetrack. Yes, very demanding layout, very easy to make a mistake. Caught Wink Cup out when he didn't get enough curb there at turn 13, ran wide. That shot that we had a moment ago as we go inside the garage at Shell V Power Racing reminds me of a couple of important tactical points for later in the weekend. Craig Lowndes, Jack LeBrock will be sharing a pit boom. Tim Blanchard, Todd Hazelwood will share a pit boom. Lee Holdsworth and Will Davison will share a pit boom. And that becomes a bit important in the strategy. Highlights now, practice number two, Adelaide 500. First hit out for the Virgin Australia Supercars Championship of 2018. And more sunlight on the racetrack, and that was to become a factor in the end game. Car number 25, James Courtney put a bruise in the left rear corner of the Mobile One Boost Mobile Holden Commodore. And that delayed his progress, but an even bigger scar for car number six. Monster Energy Ford Falcon for Cam Waters. Very heavy contact. Didn't get the line right at turn eight, unfortunately. And just piled into the wall. Scotty McLaughlin, big numbers. We're looking forward to qualifying. Yeah, qualifying is going to be pretty exciting. Absolutely, Crompo. We'll just, uh, again, butt in, as I'm getting used to doing with these guys, as uh, Ludo's just uh, trying to debrief. 
Thanks, Ludo. Just hold on one sec. Hey, uh, good, interesting session. Not as fast yeah. as the first one. Track evolving. We saw some shots of you in your car, and you're having to work that thing a little bit, you know, quite yeah. hard at the moment. Bloody oath. Yeah, it's um, it's yeah, it's tough work out there. Like the, the, the you know, it's a bit different now. Just I guess the heat's come up in the track, so it's quite loose. But uh, yeah, through eight, it's sketchy. It is very sketchy this year. Um, they have resurfaced there, and. I thought everyone thought it was probably going to be grippy, but it's probably looser. So, well, for us, it is. You are uh, finding it a little bit difficult to be as precise with the front of the car at the moment. Just saw a fair bit of understeer going on in a few shots. Yeah, it is. It's, it's different. So we're just trying to work through that. Um, I was surprised to be where we were, um, but I'm sure there's a lot more yet to come from uh, people down the road. Well, it's going to be interesting then, oh, isn't yeah. it? Tell me about it. Yeah, it's going to be good. Thanks, mate. Yes. Nick Perkett, I know you're pretty proud to, when you're here at the uh, Adelaide 500 being an Adelaide boy and things looking good so far yeah early days but um yeah the boys done a great job obviously the two cars i think we're third and fourth and uh to be honest it's um i hate saying it because when you're at the front but it's there's still a lot to come from it i think um if we can tidy up a few things we'll go there's a good chunk of time in the car so um yeah but it's enjoyable driving it you know we've got the like i said all along we've got the same engine package as the guys down the road now so it's just purely about tuning our chassis and uh, makes the sessions easier and hopefully qualifying it rolls the right way because last year we were uh, in the tent in practice and just outside in quali for missing the shootout so um, yeah fingers crossed we can tune it up for this afternoon and go again. You said there's more in the car but you said it's not feeling quite so good so how much more can you find this afternoon in quali? Um, I'd like to think we've got a good three tents in that final sector. Um, it's not quite nice coming back into the parklands. I think there's been a few shots of me right up on the wall there, and it's just a little bit too loose, and then it's um, difficult to stop at the final one. So if we can tidy up those two things, I think it'll help the rest of the lap, but then it'll really um, light up that last sector. Beautiful. I look forward to seeing this other. Thank you. Thank you. Down here in uh, Craig Lounge's garage, just quickly want to show you, this is the front of the new Commodore. If I was holding, I'd be getting onto the teams and saying, I'd make a condition to leave that little chrome ring and that little chrome bit. A lot of them are painting out, and I've got to say, I reckon the front of it looks way better. But that's just the car guy in me. Another interesting thing you'll note in this garage, single car team, Craig Lounge, obviously Triple Eight, and over here, LeBrock. Techno, very interesting how they operate as two single car teams, but within the same garage, without a wall between them. Hate doing this bit, but got to do it sometimes. Uh, it's what I get paid to do. Sorry to interrupt, Seal. No, get that sentence away, mate. I can see that's an important one. Go, go. No, we've got more to do. He's got to get you out no. of here. <laughs> I can see that, mate. But forget that session specifically, mate. Early impressions, the new Commodore. You've been in enough new cars over your years. Where's this one fit? Uh, it's actually really nice. I think it's got great potential. It's, just, it's got good rear stability. Um, I think we're all suffering a little bit of front, but that's just the aero. Like, obviously, everyone's got to understand the mechanicals under the car are all the same. So um, for us, we just got to untap a little bit of the car itself and the way that it's balanced. Ride height's quite crucial, um, and that's something we're playing with. Just on that point, Scaife, he picked up, and he's dead right. When you look at the vision on the cameras during the session, all the Holdens, for obvious reasons, there's not many spares here, are running very high not to damage the splitter. That's hurting for sure. Oh, yeah, but we're lowering it as we're going. So, uh, yeah, you're right when that, that statement, or Scaife is. Um, he's still got good eyes. And um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we're just sort of playing around with getting a balance of the car. As you know, we did a bit of a race run then. Um, the car was actually quite good in race trip. We just got to make sure we're sharpening it up now for quality. All right, mate, I'm only coming and asking because a lot of us want to see you do really well this year, pal. Thank you. Tim Slade, we're gearing up for qualifying this afternoon. You were the super fast man at the opening test season, uh, opening test at the start of the season. Has that transferred here in Adelaide? Yeah. Um, it feels quite different. Obviously, um, extremely different circuits. Uh, but yeah, so far today we've had pretty reasonable pace. Um, yeah, I mean that that session then worked out relatively well for us. So um, yeah, so far seems pretty good. Qualifying's a bit away now, so I'd imagine the conditions will change a little bit. So um, 